recording and like, oh, I was like, I was only like in my early 20s, so it was really <laughs> quite something. Um, of course, um, in protocol, I acknowledge the uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam peoples here. It's always, um, it shows a pretty good place to live. So, I mean, we're really amazed and, and grateful to, to have this space within their territory and um, um, just a sort of an, ama an amazing time, I think, for, for these types of discussions and dialogues to, to occur. Um, yeah, I mean, yesterday, it's, it's, it's a, the creator, as the creator would have it, <laughs> it's, it's quite something to have a tectonic shift occur in law the day before the subject matter which you're going to discuss. So you're actually, you're, you're lucky. Of course, I sort of knew the day. So uh, I was uh, able to incorporate and adapt my presentation uh, for it. So you're actually going to be the very first people to have a, like a, the very first members of the public that didn't sign non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> that can have, can have a full discussion of the legislation. Because of course it was tabled yesterday morning and now this, I mean, your timing is such that this is the first time I think the, the, the legislation will actually ever be presented in any, any detail to the public. So lucky us. Um, I also again, take a little bit of liberty and um, uh, there's a point in a, my presentation where uh, one of the slides where I'm gonna pivot um, from, from the presentation and just read like what the speaking notes that, um, that I actually had, had drafted for the, for the regional chief of the BC Assembly First Nations, which also I think is because his comments are so broad in context also really put the legislation in its context. So you can get a bit of a sense of the flavor um, of what he said yesterday from the legislature floor. Of course, he's a politician and he's the one that gets to decide what, what he actually speaks to. So the speaking notes are actually more fulsome than, than what he actually did say. I was trying to put a lot, like a lawyer, I was trying to put a lot of, um, of language in there that could be put into Hansard so that later we could use that language for interpretive uh, case law and such. But uh, he knows better than I do. <laughs> Clients do what they want and uh, so, uh, so. Since, I, since I've captured you today, I guess I get to do a little, this is the few times where I get to do what I want, so not at home or anything. Um, so let's get going. I changed the title too. Okay, it was sort of a slow fade, Gordon. It was really epic. So I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, I'm just going to short form free prior informed consent to FPIC. So from now on, FPIC means that. Um, so I'll give some opening comments. And then I'm going to skip to my speaking notes, which actually addresses a lot of the FPIC versus veto discussion. Then FPIC at law. So I'm going to take a little bit of a look at areas of Canadian case law that have already discussed cons uh, consent and make it binding law in, in Canada. Then I'm going to take a bit of a channel shift and give you a bit of a sense of what does FPIC look like in negotiated industry to First Nation agreements or impact benefit agreements. Um, like what does industry want and what, it, what do Indigenous groups want and how do they sort of meet in the middle? Because actually I think that, as I'll say a bit in much more detail later, um, impact benefit, benef benefit agreements are actually some of the best examples of achieving free prior informed consent. And that already is a very like, substantial business norm that's accepted. So um, I'll go with the, into that a bit more of detail, which gives you some tangible ideas of how that applies to things like major projects. Um, then just sort of some, some broader thinking about free prior informed consent, its promises, its perils, and then a very bright future, which we, of course, the legislation has sort of delivered that incredibly like void time that we're, that we're in. I can say yesterday probably, and I was talking to the regional chief after, after it, he couldn't, we couldn't think of it like a more extraordinary day as sort of indigenous advisor and indigenous leaders than yesterday to have like the most respected leaders of the day sort of look back, look forward to the future, especially because so many, you know, there's been like the, the movement to develop the UN Declaration 
with such a world indigenous people's um, investment for the last three decades to see for British Columbia to be the very first jurisdiction, common law jurisdiction in the world to develop, to make the declaration binding law is good reason, a good moment for pause. So that was yesterday and here we are today. So in terms of some, some opening comments, I think people immediately wonder um, what's the role of indigenous law in, in this body. And I think it's one of the things you really have to put in context is that modern like uh, Canadian Aboriginal law, at least like the common law aspect of it, is really still very much at its infancy. Um, whereas indigenous legal orders, law that's developed by indigenous peoples, it's been here since time immemorial. Courts have like, like redound, resoundingly recognized that, that there were pre-existing legal systems that occurred here pre-contact. So it's without, that's without, that's not really open for debate. One of the things I think that people don't often sort of think through that lens is that Indigenous legal orders are actually the real true source of Indigenous rights and title. And Section 35 and UNDRIP and any other real document that follows it, they're just going to be affirmations of those existing rights, but they're not the source of it. Like some people sort of think of the Constitution as being in some, somehow that it is the source of Indigenous rights, but that's not it at all. It's our own laws. One of the other, uh, because there is so much actually really progressive work starting, like sort of starting to sort of reinvigorate Indigenous legal orders, there's much more, both UVIC and, UV, and UBC and to some extent SFU are actually doing a lot of work in Indigenous communities themselves and helping them reinvigorate their Indigenous legal orders. And one of the sort of core conclusions I think that, that, that many sort of experts in that subject matter um, have come to is that Indigenous legal orders are very consent based. They're very much like getting permissions and the right to use this song, the interpretation of this song by this particular year, the acknowledgement of its original ownership, things of that sort of are very consent based. So consent is something that's inherent in indigenous legal orders. It's not something that's in any way foreign. Um, with that sort of consent based wisdom, um, that's how we since time immemorial have governed our territories. So we'll continue to do so in the future. We've been doing it for a little while already. And that will, I think, so there's a real, it's very easy for, I think, indigenous communities to embrace consent. And I think for many communities, that's really gonna be the only way forward. And that's really been in some ways the fundamentals of the advocacy that I, of the work that I've done, like in, at the community level, like regional, national, and international, that there's been a real, continuity to that that has always been about like some simple simple phrases like nothing about us without us or you need our permission to advance that it's always been like one of the core i think the like, indigenous people will never will be will maintain that resilience of of that being always the goal that we achieve consent in every single area which will be a return to our to our to our legal system, so that at some point that will, that harmony will establish. And in some respects, that's I think hopefully the era that we're sort of moving towards. So that's why I think we're in a tremendously exciting and amazing time. It already did, it already was like a, I mean it already is like an extraordinary time to practice Indigenous law. I mean. Um, that was really, this now I'll really date myself. Um, like I went to law school in, um, from like 95 to, to 99. So pre-century, turn of the century. <laughs> we still have, you know, just with, with stone tablets and stuff. Um, but I, like I always, I still often sort of characterize my, like my um, career as being one uh, being sort of a child, a, ch a child of the law, and that's not because I'm immature, but it's uh, that like lots of the main core cases that, that really dramatically shift and that are part of the most relevant parts of, of indigenous practice now were like occurred in 1996, like the Vanderpeet trilogy came out in 1996, then Delgamuk, the first case to establish Aboriginal title test came in 97, 
And then the rest of it sort of just been my, my career cases like Haida and Chilcote and all those things happened like while I was practicing. So that to me, it's been, it's, it's just an exciting like whirlwind. But it, I think that, that we are like at a certain convergence right now when you look at all the different sort of various political commitments around the, the Truth of Reconciliation, around the UN Declaration, um, the subs very sub the substantiveness of the case law that's being developed, there's a real radical empowerment. Like I've sort of been practicing in that time when Indigenous people, like I think you would be hard pressed to sort of find another area of any population in Canada or the world that has, that's, that's been like privilege to that like rapid empowerment. Of course, that's like, of course, that's also coming from an extremely disempowered like, and we're still that empowerment is like us trying to break through like great social injustices. But it the, that level of empowerment to be part beyond that rocket ship is like quite it is quite something. So I really think it's a tremendously exciting time like for all of us. Um, especially in terms of implementing the declaration because it is so fundamental. You know, it's, it's based on human rights. So those are the universal things that are, things that are universal to all British Columbians, to all Canadians. Like that's the journey that we're on together. That there will be some like that, like a document will radically change the laws of British Columbia, but it'll be based on human rights. And that's, that hasn't happened before, <laughs> and but it will be for the benefit of like of all of all British Columbians for that reason because it'll be based it'll be driven by human rights principles. Um, so with that said, I'm going to pivot to the this, this speech that wasn't really given. This is like you know it's sort of a really part of an ego piece. Like hey, why didn't you say that? Say that yes, regional chief. Why didn't you say my really important words? No, but uh, <laughs> I mean it's um. It gives you some other context that, that um, um, sorry, this, my uh, screen's timed out as you, as you would have it. Okay, maybe I won't be giving that speech today. Oh, there we go. I used my face. <laughs> it recognizes me now, so. Must be the weird glasses or something. So I'll just read right in, into the speech itself. Today, we make history. We're the only common law jurisdiction in the world to develop legally binding legislation, committing, making UNDRIP applicable at law. This law will silence the debate that the declaration is merely aspirational international principles. This law enables negotiated consent-based agreements between First Nations and British Columbia. This law has the potential for all British Columbians to change their political, legal, and societal landscape. It is a proud day. Today, from this day forward, all articles of the UN Declaration will be applicable law in British Columbia. Today and from this day forward, our respective governments, First Nations and Crown will work together to ensure that BC's laws are consistent with the Declaration. We're going to leave colonization where it should be in the past. Dead will be concepts of terra nullis, discovery, and Crown paramountcy. We will live what we'll live will be the constitutional partnership, the co-development of our laws together, and an era of mutual consent. To make history is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage, and I know this government, I know our peoples, have the courage to deliver. I do not want to spend a lot of time on this, but I know there are many that fear change in this province. It is human. If we bring this to a hard point, some will oppose this law because of their fears of what an era of mutual consent means. There is comfort in the Crown having veto rights. It is powerful to exercise and deny others rights. There is fear in the idea 
of sharing power and jurisdiction. I want to say strongly and clearly here, the declaration law is not about providing any government with veto rights. Consent and veto are polar opposites. Consent is about agreement. Consent is about a process of achieving and maintaining agreements. Consent is about sharing and respecting our laws as equals and partners. Veto is about unilateral action, overriding others and overruling jurisdiction. Consent is the trend of court cases. Consent is the future. And most simply is about us coming together as equals as governments. Veto rights is the past and it divides us by subjugating Indigenous peoples. Veto is a colonial tool and we reject it. It is my opinion, Mr. Premier, that when the sky is clearing to a brighter future for all British Columbians, the last thing we do is to pretend the sky is falling. I'd probably just leave it there. Yeah. The rest of it's about economic prosperity and stuff, but. <laughs> So that's, uh, again, get, touches on a lot of the sections of the, of the legislation that are coming in. I'll touch on them more. But it gives you like, uh, some, some of that pause of like what the significance of, for the first time ever in BC's history, having four of our First Nations leaders of the, four, of the three organizations speak from the podium, from the floor of the legislature. And, also, actually, the NDP and the, um, and, and the Greens, of course, they all voted in, in favor of the first reading. And uh, surprisingly, the Liberals were silent, actually, so, and said generally positive words. So I guess we'll see like what the next, like the, I'm sure people who are lawyers in the room know that there's still gonna be two more readings. Um, the expectation is that the, I mean, obviously with a Green NDP alliance, there's nothing without, people changing their votes, which will not happen. Um, it will be law. And the general sort of best guess is that that could take, it could, it could be law in the next two weeks. So that's a pretty amazing achievement for the, the decades that came before it of this sort of advocacy. So I've already more or less talked on all the, the content about consent for his veto, because it's sort of covered already in, my, in the speech. So I think one of the important things is to, to debunk the myth. Like there's a lot of, um, 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 it's mostly industry-based lawyers that will sort of try and say that consent really has no place in Canadian law. That's just absolutely wrong. I mean, since 2014, it's, the Supreme Court of Canada clarified unanimously that consent is the requirement for Aboriginal title holders when, the duty, when, when you're asked about what is the standard that, that of duty consult. And then since 1997, which you'd be amazed you'd still have to ask the question, you know, because that's so long ago, that's when I was like in law school. <laughs> they, it already was very clearly spelled out that consent that when, in the scope of consultation being either uh, mere consultation, accommodation, or consent, that consent w could in certain circumstances be the appropriate standard. Um, so it has, it's already been, it's definitively already part of Canadian law from the Supreme Court of Canada. So people who try and tell you otherwise that it, doesn't, it didn't have a place in it, or that the declaration, some, this declaration law somehow creates that new consent requirement are just trying to, are, are, are just speaking legally incorrect. I think one of the things that is said in the speech and, and, and you can sort of pause on here is that now like with, with, with the, the onset of this legislation, the arguments that whether or not free prior informed consent is just merely an aspirational concept should be silenced because it now will form part of, of British Columbia law. In, in fact, in section 2.8, it says that that statute will affirm that the application of the declaration to all of the laws of British Columbia. Then under section three, it creates a positive obligation for BC to co-develop laws in 
in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous people to ensure that all laws are consistent with the declaration. And then the more sort of like probably one of the sections of it that will probably be particularly interesting for people is that under Section 7.1, the BC government is now enabled to enter into consent-based agreements with Indigenous people. I don't, that's probably like a bit of a, a bit of like a, a legal nuance issue, but generally like when you're negotiating with the, with the Crown, there's sort of like a scale of levels of agreement, like co-management, collaboration, collaborative decision-making, joint decision-making, shared decision-making. For the longest time, there's been sort of a glass ceiling there where in this, the potential of this section is that that glass might be broken now, that that the, there could actually be fully consent-based agreements. And that will be very interesting because um, it's not just that Indigenous laws are being going to be treated as potential equals or that Indigenous peoples will have equal decision-making authority, is that it actually requires constitutional um, retreat. The province has to make space in its own jurisdiction to allow for that consent-based agreement because it would be based on their own legal authority. So that's... I mean, that's something for the legal nerds, but it is really fascinating because there are no, there really aren't, there, there's agreements in British Columbia that have like the aim of achieving consent, but you couldn't find an agreement where the actual requirement is consent. And now that glass ceiling is, is broken so that you'll, you can reasonably expect that government to government agreements, will, the call will be for those to be consent based from now on, which is an amazing like shift. So this is a bit of like a channel, a, a channel switch because, but I mean, this is actually where the majority of like my time is spent is negotiating impact benefit agreements, which are in the duty to consult sort of context. So people sort of often ask, so like, what does that mean? What is that going to mean for resource development? And so I thought it might be sort of useful to give you a bit of a sense of sort of like what does industry want in an agreement and what does what what do indigenous people want? Of course, these are just you know, obviously I'm not like universally speaking for all, for all indigenous people here, just on you know, my my long experience <laughs> in in the area. But I mean, um, and I've actually it's sort of interesting because I've had to present on this just sort of like almost as devil's advocate for myself, where I I've had to sort of try and think about like what does industry really want and then present for them, just, you know, as a, just for a, stra a strange perspective to take on. But, um, I mean, I think industry, like, more than anything, and I think actually why you are hearing many industry opponents embracing the legislation, like for, like, so far, the BC Business Council, the Association of Mine Exploration, um, Mining, the Mining Association of British Columbia have all in sort of optimistically endorse the legislation that was tabled yesterday, which is sort of extraordinary, really. Um, of course, the BC Federation and, and environmental, many environmental and human rights organizations similarly endorse it, but they're, I mean, that's sort of like the, the body of progressive voters. <laughs> so, I mean, it's amazing, though, to see, like, that industry is, like, completely is equally behind it and trying to figure out, like, what their role will be in the next steps. Um, so, I mean, I think more than anything, what industry wants, like from project development, is legal certainty. Like, they want to know, like, what are the requirements that they have to meet, and then how much is that going to cost them, really, in some respects. So, I mean, the norm uh, for industry is to try and negotiate uh, instead of trying to negotiate sort of life of project agreements. The sort of adaptation for most industry in the industry context is to negotiate a series of sort of pragmatic incremental agreements. So you enter into like a letter of a, letter of understanding, an MOU, a project agreement, maybe an environmental agreement or something. But you, instead of trying to do like the, the one super agreement that will bind them all, they now sort of do a sort of a series and that's been sort of an adaptation. Um, like one of the really like substantial live issues for, for industry is whether or not the duty to consult has been fulfilled. And then they want some sort of clarity around whether or not, um, like whether or not the, the duty to consult has been delegated to them. So I think they'll probably similarly look for that in like what do the next steps of Bill 41 implementation look like, especially on the consent issue. Um, like nowadays the term social license is lots of like even Trans Mountain 
even Transvaun envelops itself in the idea that they won't they wouldn't proceed with a project without a social license. But that's sort of I guess a softer way of sort of saying having quasi approval. Um, I think all proponents, at least the selling point of their project, is always that whatever project they're doing mining, whether it's a mine or it's a pipeline or it's a for, or it's a forestry tenure, is that they want to leave like an economic footprint of prosperity in the, at least for local communities. And then, of course, there is a really like, clear the, that sort of legal certainty element is actually really brought to bear on whether or not the regulatory approval has certainty. Um, so, will their yes actually be a yes? And of course, that's in some ways where we see the most, like some of the most sort of high profile and dynamic sort of friction points in, in you know, projects like Northern Gateway or the Trans Mountain is that review of whether or not the project's there, the, the, the project yes actually is a yes or whether or not the duty to consult has been fulfilled. So that gives you a bit of a sense of sort of like how, like, where consent is applicable to them and, and why they'll be, like, be very interested in like what the next steps look like. Um, I mean, it's often very immediately asked at any start of any negotiations, like what, the, what, do, what do you indigenous peoples want? And I mean, I think, I think because like the indigenous party is going to be like there, has been there since time immemorial and plans to be there for whatever the, for the infinite future, like their goals in any negotiation to achieving consent are, are are different and much more longer like longer in scope. So they know that they haven't been very active participants in the economy, and that hasn't been the history of Canada. But they want an equitable role in the economy, whether or not that's that's things that are as tangible as contracts and in, in, in employment, or if it gives they are looking for maybe prosperity funds that allow them to do capacity building into the future. But having an, a real equitable role and not to see projects sort of like blow through their territory without them having any benefit is something that they're 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 working against and trying to change. Um, obviously, the role of of indigenous legal orders and traditional knowledge, as it's sometimes uh, called, is is one of the one of the core elements of where there's a really deep sense of respect. So that sort of like translates to things that are sort of tangible, like you want traditional, your own traditional knowledge studies to be treated equally to other baseline studies that are assessing the project. But then there's also more a broader scope of things where things where there's a question of like what are the indigenous legal, legal orders that apply, and for some more sophisticated indigenous groups, that's like will you give equal weight to our own economic and environmental assessment. Like for instance, there's some, some really good examples of the Squamish Nation and Slayer Nation locally doing full environmental assessments of projects themselves and they want those they want those assessments to be treated as equals. In fact, the new BC environmental assessment legislation which preceded this, which has lots of very interesting elements in itself, um, has the aim of reconciling the, the indigenous assess where there are indigenous assessments and BC assessments together. So that has the possibility of those assessments being treated as equals. Um, and there's also a goal for any environmental assessment to achieve consent. So you combine those two things together, that's a pretty dramatic like, and potentially amazing future on that issue. Um, lots of indigenous, lots of impact benefit agreements include environmental sections, partly because I guess we'll see whether or not that's as much of an emphasis in British Columbia where right now our environmental laws are going sort of like the more progressive direction, whereas of course like this area of law sort of is like, you have like deregulation and hyper-regulation sort of happening at any given time. So in British Columbia, of course, and in federally, the environmental legislation standards are probably sort of on the rise, whereas say before that, with Liberals and the and, and the Tories federally, the, the legislation was actually going the opposite direction. So, whether or not there will be separate standalone, like they'll be having environment compliance sections in IBAs, is sort of a bit of an unknown. Um, most of that legislation hasn't really, still hasn't, or is new. So there probably will be for at least a transition period. Be an emphasis on that, just to say that these are the environmental standards that apply in our territory, as opposed to sort of like what the what the statute says. Um, Obviously, I think, like any Canadians, the Indigenous people want to have a prosperous and sustained livelihood. 
They want benefits that are going to leave a legacy, not just be like short-term benefits. And then I think there's the broader sort of like asp partly aspirational like hope that the investment that's going into the, to the project will be equal to that that's left in the territory. I think one of the last things that I think is really go, speaks to sort of the equity aspect of it is that really only agreements that are fair and equitable really will stand the test of time. Like a, if, when companies sort of do fast, fast and quick deals, the next like group of like leaders are like the for one of the first questions. Like sometimes we get we get brought impact benefit agreements that we negotiated, and we try and look for that longevity. But very often we get agreements where there's been when the, where the agreements themselves are not equitable and the first nations are trying to find a way out of the agreement how to breach the agreement or determine if there's been a fundamental breach so i think if you want an agreement that's going to last the life of a project then it has to be equitable from the start and like you should keep that in mind otherwise unless you want to have short-term legal certainty so that gives you like a bit of a sense of sort of like what it, like what is it going to take to achieve consent in an actual sort of real life project and analysis. Now for maybe some of the sort of like more broader sort of promises. Um, achieving consent has the possibilities of really raising like, the power, powerful significance of applying indigenous legal orders as equal to the common law statute and all of the policy and operational elements. I mean, I think that's what really sort of in some ways speaks to that sort of human rights element is that one of the core, I think one of the core goals you could say that indigenous people want is equality. They want their laws to be treated equal to others. They want indigenous legal orders to be treated equally to, to statutes. Indigenous legal orders be treated equally to, to de facto law through policies. So that is sort of like one of it, it's 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 part hope, part part promise. I mean, this sort of shift to consent could also really stimulate a, a robust engagement at the community level because, as I said, there already are a fair amount of sort of like environmental and sort of academic engagement on trying to reinvigorate indigenous legal orders in some respects like moving to a consent model that that asks the question well what does your law say is going to in itself stimulate a lot of activity on 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 potential codification of indigenous law or just indigenous people themselves getting a better sense of like like what would our what are the core elements of our legal systems that apply to this particular project or this particular approval or this education act or this child and welfare situation so it's it's probably going to cause sort of a bit of like a hyper renaissance and emphasis on this entire body of work that is already sort of happening like at a mostly academic level and in project specific level but the need for it especially if there's an entire body of legal reform like that's going to be sort of saying that indigenous legal orders should be treated equally in this decision, it does necessitate that a lot more work has to happen at the community level. I mean, I think it's sort of generically sort of like, um, will require a real dramatic shift in what we sort of consider reconciliation. Because some, in some respects, like the term reconciliation has sort of some way been bastardized. Like it's not really about sort of coming together as equals. It's much more about paramountcy. It's like, if we talk about this enough, eventually we'll just overrule your decision and do what we were gonna do in the first place. Like that's sort of reconciliation right now. Like I think that, you know, even Trudeau would say he, he had, he's achieved reconciliation on the Trans Mountain. Like I current legal standards, so I mean, I think like that there's a real hope that there'll be a dramatic shift through legal reform and for this dramatic shift in law that that reconciliation will maybe get sort of taken back as a, role, a word of significance for, for indigenous people. Because I think for a lot of people, the word's like just another four letter word. It's the day, it's the word of the day of, a, of bureaucratic speak, or it's been watered down so much that it has little to no significance. I mean, as uh, the, um, Jody Wilson-Raybould said it, and she was the Attorney General, it's like there are many in government that say the words reconciliation, but they really mean denial of rights. So 
the hope like that it, this presents is that we will see start seeing a dramatic shift in all law. I should have wore the lapel because I wouldn't be hitting the pen. <laughs> um, I think like you know like one of the, the the other real great hopes is that that through consent will really start finally achieving an honorable partnership, constitutional partnership. I mean, it probably goes without saying that people like, you know, Canadian history hasn't so far displayed this like arm in arm partnership. So it, it should create a dramatic space if it's achieved well, especially if we achieve this at the provincial and the federal level. So, I mean, I think that's one of the real tremendous hopes like for the future and something that like Indigenous peoples have been advocating like since time immemorial and will continue to be like one of their like their their long their long term goals is that they will actually be treated as partners. I think that like one of the other sort of elements is that consent will actually bring a tremendous amount of legal certainty, I think, to like what is needed to achieve like project support. So actually I think that contrary to people feeling like that the there's going to be economic Armageddon, which is sort of the the basic sort of like the basic analysis that happens like for industries that resist change, is that it'll actually if you have if you know what you need to achieve, consent can actually actually achieve greater prosperity. It'll weed out projects that that cannot afford to like a vigorous involvement with communities. Like if you're sort of thinking you if if you if you can't afford it, it'll it'll naturally weed them out. The reality is actually there are lots of things, elements of indicators that actually make a project uneconomic. This, but this, but this may be one of them, those things is that they won't be able to develop the project based on our constitution, which is fine by me. But it's also like I think it's just I think that we have to set some basic principles that we're going to say that that we're any project that happens in Canada has to be human rights compliant. If that's something that we all believe in as Canadians, then it's something I think that that sets like a very solid baseline for the future. I mean, obviously, there's people are drawn, and lots of the questions that at least we've had in the media also like ask sort of like, could it be, will this mean that some projects won't be approved? And the answer is probably a very a very clear yes. Some things will not be able to achieve consent, but then, like I say, like that's. We have to determine, I think, as, as like as Indigenous people, as Canadians, as British Columbians, like what are going to be the like, the minimum conditions for for economic prosperity, and um, human rights and in, in 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 environmental sustainability are things that I think most British Columbians and Canadians believe in. I mean, what is going to happen now? And this maybe let me pivot a bit back to the legislation. Is that at least Bill 41 requires that all BC laws be consistent with the declaration. It also creates a mechanism under the action plan to start identifying priorities. So it won't be that all of a sudden magically every single law that's not compliant with the declaration will become like, will be rendered um, like illegal. That's not going to happen. So if anyway, I was worried about that. I mean, it, what it develops is a really quite a, like actually a pretty progressive incremental process. So the action plan will be co-developed by First Nations or Indigenous peoples and, um, and the BC government. And like any legislative agenda discussion, they'll determine like what are the priorities between the parties and then start looking at different areas of legislation. Like in my opinion, it would make some sense to take on legislation which might be a bit more where there's greater capacity already existing in Indigenous communities. Like for instance, um, there's been a lot of work done recently on child and welfare. And there's a lot of capacity at the, high, at the highest levels of Indigenous communities on that subject matter. So that might be an area that would make sense to make a priority area for making compliant with the declaration. It's also something I think that universally appeals to everybody and is very clearly in the human rights context. Education might be another might might be another priority that's sort of a, a bit low hanging fruit in the sense that people everyone real, realizes and appreciates the role that education has had in as an oppressive tool and how it also can be and we hope it can be an empowering tool 
So that too might be like a subject matter, which makes a lot of sense to take on like as a priority. Um, that's not really for me to decide because of course I'm not, you know, I'm not the political leadership that will have to identify that, but those seem to me like if you're going to, like this legislation in being implemented re will require some initial successes. So it makes a lot of sense to try and choose like choose things that you know you can be successful early on. And I mean, uh, I was I I'd speculated also yesterday in a, in a news article that forestry might also make a lot of sense, which people are like, oh, geez, isn't the forestry industry basically collapsing right now? I mean, and part of the, the thing is that I, I said said this yesterday in the media too, which is that um, I mean, forest the forestry industry is sort of in a bit of a Jenga type of circumstance. And is going to require rebuilding, especially is going to require like government to have a role in rebuilding it, like maybe like in a way that might make some people comfortable uncomfortable in the industry, but where there is a real need, like where even the industry is saying we need your help. I think like so if you have a, a resource subject matter like that where you have this opportunity to rebuild it. This might be like one of those subject matters which makes a lot of sense because of course forestry is like something that's very much on the ground where there's a history of sort of the war in the woods where you actually have industry that is sort of already on the same page in lots of different circumstances because some of the most robust areas of impact benefit agreements is actually been happening in forestry for the last two decades. So lots of the progressive survivors of the forestry industry already have fairly positive relationships. So they're actually a pretty friendly stakeholder to bring into it. Like that'll be sort of a bit of a different analysis in terms of an action plan because those resource areas I think are going to require greater pragmatism in bringing ensuring that stakeholders are at the table and in fact basically the BC Business Council is in some ways making that a condition of their support is that they are part of the process um, which you know I think in some respects like something this significant where there's going to be so much legal reform across so many different subject matters there needs to be, there does need to be stakeholder involvement, but there also needs to be members of civil society and environmental, the environmental movement need to all be at that table. Because like indigenous people are the last people to sort of say that they have all the capacity. We have that humility to know that there's going to be, like I think the way that this is going to be successful is if all of us have that humility to say, okay, we need help here. And I think then, then we'll see successful implementation of it, so. I think one of the things that's also like the promise of like FPIC end of the of, of the of Bill 41 is that BC has set the standard that can that others can improve upon. And every single province in probably every single attorney general in Canada yesterday started reading Bill 41 whenever it, whenever it went online to get a sense of sort of like is this something because now in every single like every single jurisdiction indigenous people are going to be saying like let's let's do that here so it'll be very interesting like bc has set the standard we based it on bill c262 which failed in the senate um they were like it was passed by the house of commons and then and then then didn't garnish enough support in the senate mostly because <laughs> Somebody didn't whip their people together. I'm not saying it was Trudeau. Anyway, um, it wasn't because he was thought he was worried about Trans Mountain. Anyway, we built, we based our like let the it was like part of the pro the commitment from the BC government was to use 262 as a model. So we took 262 and then we we made it better. We made it much more tangible to what's happening in, in British Columbia and and what we think is sort of progressive like developments in our context. The reality is actually British Columbia is far more advanced than any other jurisdiction on the way that it engages with indigenous people because almost all of the like key cases on the duty to consult originate from British Columbia. So and the fact that actually like what seems like a disadvantage and that there are very few modern day treaties or historical treaties here actually has like keeps like our creativity and our pragmatism like unrestricted. Of course it's easy to pump up your own problems but now with the perils, um, I mean, I think there's going to be there's certainly going to be some dif difficulty in the interim because of this hyper emphasis on the role of Indigenous law. There will be many communities that will struggle with that because 
It's not that Indigenous legal orders or that our law has in any is any way like disappeared. It's that there hasn't been enough capacity, and time, and effort sort of um, invested in sort of preserving and reinvigorating that. So there will be a because of there is a trend, it's going to be a tremendous amount of work in sort of reinvigorating Indigenous legal orders. It's fair to say that there's going to be a lot of stress and pressure on communities to start delivering on this. You know, I mean, it's very it's one thing to say like that you you should respect our laws, but eventually, you know, when somebody agrees to it and says yes, I'll respect your laws, what are they? Then you better have an answer, and there's gonna, that's going to cause like stress and tension. You know, so. There's a lot of work ahead of indigenous communities at the community level for them to start trying to figure out like what is, like what do their what what does what do their laws say about whatever the subject matter is that's ahead of them. Um, I mean, I think one of the sort of I guess just as just like reconciliation, I think the, the word reconciliation, which seemed like you take yourself back five years. And no one would have like put any negative context around the word reconciliation. Whereas now, I think it's fair to say like that FPIC could could, could suffer that same that, that 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 same word analysis if it's not honored and it's used in watered down forms. That you could undermine even the even like this the highest level of approval. So I mean, I think that's something that we'll have to be aware of. Especially, I think there'll be a, a lot of. Um, There'll be a lot of instances where people will say that consent was actually achieved. What's actually sort of interest, interesting and, and scary is that, like for the longest time, I actually thought that the free part, like I don't know if you guys know the breakdown essentially, like free is essentially goes to the voluntariness of it, whether or not like basically you, you were, the, the group was in duress in making its decision. So, I mean, generally in, 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 in Western countries, people don't really think of our indigenous people being, having guns to them at their heads to sign agreements. But when you think of things like, say, I don't know, like a, a politician saying, well, 43 First Nations have signed off on this project, and those that are in disagreement should respect them before their own. Then you start saying, like, it's like so does that mean that the 43 First Nations that did approve the project, that their, their yes is worth more than your no? Or... That actually does happen in a lot of instances. That's actually sort of a strategy of, of, of major projects is to try and get as many First Nations, especially the peripherally affected First Nations, first on side. And then you, you, then you have your, your, your template agreement and you force it upon the other First Nations. Like that's like essentially like the, the strategy to achieving full project support. So does it, that doesn't really sound like that's totally a voluntary context, especially when it's the prime minister saying that you should, you should respect these these people, these groups that have said yes, and you should maybe that should that should be taken into consideration. Their yes is, is worth more than your no, even though both of those contexts might be fully informed. It'd be like just sort of saying that your like, you know your vote's worth less than the ones that actually like elected the leader, but. Um, I think like, you know, in, in different contexts, there'll be different fears. I mean, I think that consent with the crown is going to be like one of the criticisms, which is fair, is that people are wondering like, well, that sounds like th this commitment to legal reform of every law that's not consistent with the declaration. That sounds like a gigantic like project. Are you going to resource that province? And then the, the question, I mean, that, the answer is like, Yes, but we don't yet know what those numbers are. But so, I mean, I think the fear of that is that there is a, a tremendous amount of political time and energy invested in, in in this change. But on the ground, there will really need to be capacity and funding, appropriate funding. And everyone sort of hears that. But is a, there is a possibility that you could have the most progressive piece of legislation and it could achieve very little in the transition period. I mean, that's a bit of a, probably a real concern in British Columbia as it is really almost anywhere in Canada if we, if, if public funding for things is being decreased. I think anybody who works in the education context probably knows that actually funding is getting, is being more and more difficult to come by. It's also an opportunity because I think of Indigenous peoples especially, 
if they can achieve funding from other sources other than government of their own, then they'll have they'll be the ones that'll bring great capacity to this legal reform initiative. So I mean, it's guess part. Like with every challenge, there is an opportunity. Um, I mean, I think like when it comes to like just like a very like, simple and tangible element, like what you know, I was telling you how different agreements use different language, like co-management, collaboration, joint decision, shared decision making. On a superficial level, like the crown in some in many instances and even industry just search and replace the word. Like they just like, okay, we're using collaborative today, whatever that means. Um, you know, we're doing it, but you know, because we say we did, we defined it collaborative as do very little and we totally did that. No, I mean it I mean it's I mean it's I mean, it, that's a bit of a concern, I think, is that the, nothing will really dramatically change, but you'll say that you were, you really literally searched, just put FPIC in every single agreement and said you achieved it. It's like, job well done. You know, you can mark that, like, that, that checkbox. So I think there is, like, going to be, a, like, a very live concern that there will be a shift in language, but not a shift in actual substantiveness. And there'll be a, an analysis about whether or not this agreement is truly consent-worthy. Because I think, like from a practical perspective, that if you want a higher standard of approval from, from an Indigenous group, so should the agreements shift to greater benefits. Maybe it doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be richer, but there'll be, there'll be more accommodations that are well thought through. And maybe there'll be longer, like long-term legacy commitments if the project sort of can't immediately fund like a dramatic like, like financial change. But there has to be a substantive accommodation <laughs> shift, I think, in IBAs if they're going to be all of a sudden become consent worthy. That leads to sort of the industry side of things. In a way, actually, they already that shift to consent has already occurred in the BC context. Because since Chilcotin, and I don't know, like, man, people probably aren't all law students here. In Chilcotin, this, from the Supreme Court of Canada, 9 0 decision, there was a very super scary like statement in it that scared the heck out of all of industry, <laughs> which said that if a project is approved and later the indigenous group is able to achieve Aboriginal title and you didn't get their consent, then the project approval could be, term could, could be like rendered nullified. Didn't say the exact words, but it sounds better that way. Um, so they become invalid. So you could have a project approval be down the road said, oh, we thought we, you know, we consulted them. We didn't get their consent though. And then later they got, they got title and you're like, did you guys get consent? Remember back? N no. And then your project could be completely eliminated. So because there was that fear, there was a shift in language to like consent. So instead of asking for support for their project, many, many industry proponents shifted to, to asking for consent to their projects. So on paper, it looks like, you know, it looks like consent is already being achieved in most industry, First Nations industry contacts or indigenous contacts. Um, but I guess the question like, like, that I often ask myself is whether or not the agreement actually in fact is consent worthy. Like if there actually were, was a change in benefits that were so great that you would consent forever. So then you end up with like a much more nuanced analysis too though, where maybe you make the consent con conditional or you change what you're negotiating like over, but you make the, probably the, the norm isn't so much that it's shifted to consent, it's more probably conditional consent right now in like sort of the, the marketplace. So um, if we are moving to like free prior informed consent as the new standard, Bill, it'll be interesting to see whether or not industry thinks it has to make any change or if they think that, well, we're already doing it already. I think some of the initial commentary actually from some of those supporters is that, yeah, we're already doing it, which is, which probably isn't completely true. It's probably like part, like, you know, partially true or one, one person's opinion. Um, I think like there, there is obviously going to be some fear that, that a shift to consent will cause economic instability. I think, that isn't, that isn't probably going, I don't, I don't think people have to like consider it really to be a boogeyman because the, especially like in the Bill 41 context, 
it's really intended to be an incremental legal reform initiative. So yes, all law, there is a commitment to make all laws consistent with the declaration, but we're going to have to sort of figure out what are the priorities of making that change. So initially, like mining law won't immediately change. That will be at some point an initiative you know, that of, of legal reform in that context. Same thing with forestry, same thing with like almost every sort of resource sector. So it's not necessarily going to, there's no reason for the fear that it's all of a sudden going to have this the dramatic, the entire economic Armageddon will immediately occur the moment in two weeks from now when, when, when Bill 41 becomes law. It just will create a commitment to do that. And the real question I think will be, which some others, even people in the audience, have already said like, what's the timeline of that? And the reality is we don't know. I think that it's fair to say that there'll be a push to have the first action plan drafted probably within this calendar year, or at least those, that dialogue will, will start. And it would make sense at least by the next fiscal year for there to be identify, identified, agreed upon action plan. So I guess the answer to that could be that we could have our first action plan in the next five to six months. And there'll be lots of different sectors trying to sort of determine, get themselves in that high priority list, I suppose. Because like within BC, First Nations, especially, we have, we have there's sort of like the, 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 high, the, the upper level like organizations, but then there's also sort of sector by sector organizations like First Nations Forestry Council, Fisheries Council, Energy and Mines. Like, so we have sort of almost like a mirror bureaucracy. So those organizations like in, of course, inside of ministries will be sort of jockeying to sort of make like their legislation like or their legal reform initiatives probably the priority. So that's what's going to happen probably over the next say two to five months. Um, and I think you know one of the other like really big questions, which you know is only one line <laughs> attributed to it, is what happens when consent is not achieved. And I think actually the the simple answer to that is that we what has been suggested since Haida, which is that we need to develop alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that place equal weight on the indigenous legal order and the common law. We need to develop that as to develop those institutions. So we'll need to develop those processes. So in some ways, I don't think the adaptation, the answer will be sort of like, well, what do you do usually when you don't agree? Well, we look at mediation, arbitration, or the courts. And I think we'll have to develop those sort of systems alongside that. And so will all the legal reform initiatives, I think. That seemed to me, seems to me to be the, the obvious answer to it, but I mean, I'm only one person freestyling here up at a mic. <laughs> Not on behalf of the BC Assembly of First Nations, if anyone's watching online. <laughs> so I guess, you know, like, to sort of finish with, like, what does the future look like? I mean, we have never in the history probably of Canada, let alone ever, ever had like the type of commitment to have the body of legal reform. It's completely unprecedented for, how, for there to be that sort of a commitment. I mean, that's just not the way that other international instruments have been ratified. Yes, like Canada has entered into many international human rights instruments, but it's never made it like, they never committed to make to do a law by law type of analysis. So that is completely unprecedented. And, but it's also, as I said, sort of something that is an, there's some real, some pragmatism to that it will have to be incremental. Um, I think like one thing you can say with, with absolute certainty from, as an indigenous advocate, is that the advocacy on this will be relentless. We probably will be more, more more inspired and more like hopeful about legal reform and change now than than ever. There's like a, if you could like say one, if you had to summarize in one word, like what happened yesterday and it was, it had to be hope. And I think that indigenous advocates are, bo are gonna be buoyed by that and ask and, and, and they'll have like the instruments to demand, to demand more to diplomatically request more and to persuade persuade more, but that's I mean the, I think it's it's fair to say that Indigenous peoples advocates will not like will have always only ever wanted consent to be treated as equals, and that advocacy is like especially void now. Um, 
I think that, you know, that there's, there, there's, like I've said sort of throughout, I think consent, like in some ways is already a norm. Like nobody sits down at a negotiation table, whether or not with government or with in, in the industry contact and says, we don't want to achieve an agreement. So in some respects, there already is sort of like a practical acceptance of the idea of consent. This hasn't been a legal requirement. And I think that's actually where I think there's, there, there's going to be a, a dramatic, a dramatic change is that like I've been for like one, like in sort of like the, especially in sort of the resource sector um, context been saying that the BC government or governments generally should make it a condition that they won't approve any project unless one they have, they have achieved consent by a government to government agreement and whether in the industry has the proponent has also achieved consent by impact benefit agreement. And I think the opportunity to advocate for that is now is now there. So, I mean, I think there is going to be like before, I think the agreements were happening sort of because it's, it makes practical, good business sense. But now I think there is going to be a shift shift to it being because that's the law and no project can proceed without consent. So there's going to be a dramatic leverage shift, I think, for Indigenous peoples, especially in project development. Um, I think, you know, like what they mostly sort of um, um, wanted to sort of give you a sense of is that, I mean, I think like there's a, we're at a time is tremendously exciting, like as there's, it's, you know, it's a time that where like you feel so buoyed by like this hopefulness that you feel naive about it. Because of course we've been down this road like before. There's been great victories like in courts. There's been the new relationship document. There's been lots of other sort of political achievements which could give you that same sense of hope. And indigenous peoples, especially I think have never, have never, have never ab abandoned that. And that might seem naive, but then you look at what we've achieved. That's a short period of time. And I think, you know, that's, I think, like what gives you a bit of a glimpse of like where we've been and what that era of mutual consent that seems to be happening in real time. So hopefully uh, that gives you a bit of a sense of sort of the landscape of consent. And um, I'm, if there's time, I'm open for questions. Sorry for talking so long. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Um, I don't want to take too much time for this question because there must be other very interesting questions. But in Peru, there is a, um, a prior indigenous consultation law. It has been enacted in 2012, 2011, and it has been um, implemented to consult about majority in its majority to consult about oil and gas exploitations. But this law turned to be just a consultation process, I mean, an information process, and no consent is agreed. Um, and well, the law and the regulation itself has a lot of problems. So what do you suggest could be the measures to be in place now here that for that law to don't become just an information process? Just we, we are um, very aware about the power dynamics between those involved in the negotiations. Thank you. I mean, I think that's that's the concern. I think immediately that that there's been a commitment to consent, but when it'll really translate to like the average bureaucrat is that it actually will just continue to do the duty to consult stuff that we've been doing all along. Um, I mean, it's sort of difficult to answer sort of like in the hypothetical, but I think that it's fair to say that like the, the analysis that, that we've been sort of thinking about is that 
The duty to consult in a whole body of, like I don't know if you know, in, in Canada there's like been a tremendous body of duty to consult law. And the very lowest standard is just pure information sharing. And then in the middle, there's sort of supposed to be more than mere consultation, whatever that means. Um, and then accommodation. So probably like the sort of the norm is that there has to achieve consultation, you have, you have to at minimum accommodate. So that's developed a whole bunch of sort of variety of government to government agreements. So I think that the instances where you would only ever achieve just information sharing, I'd have to say that probably the 